Hey, what's going on? Welcome to the first of the unnamed podcast. Doesn't have a name right now, but by the time this is uh, all edited together, I'm sure we'll have decided on one. I'm Martin, and I'm joined by Jeff, and we're doing a quick dive into some history, starting with some uh, historical figures, starting with Charles Martel, a man who I had heard many stories about, but I wasn't really too familiar with the story, and uh, Jeff brought this one to me, and I thought it would be a really cool subject to dive into, and uh, I think it's a great place to start, because this guy's nickname was The Hammer, and uh, I think that's a great uh, way to be remembered throughout history. And uh, I think we're just going to dive right into it uh, because he uh, was a pretty influential man when it, in terms of history and uh, was kind of the founder of a ton of the most important and influential uh, dynasties that took place after his death. So, uh, Jeff, I think uh, we're just going to dive really into who Charles Martel is. Yeah, I mean... Most people are probably going to recognize more the name of his grandson, uh, which is Charlemagne, which, you know, known as the, the father of modern Europe is a, a pretty big deal, which technically does make Charles Martel the grandfather of modern day Europe or great grandfather. So it might be. But we're going with grandfather because it sounds better. So Charles Martel was, you know, a, a major influencing factor in the uh, the late uh, 600s. Uh, he was born in 686, obviously stretching into the 700s for his influence as well. He was born, uh, well, 686 by some records. Some records are 688. Some records are 689. Yeah. As you know, with historical texts, some things can get <laughs> lost in translation. Yeah. Uh, but we do know is that he was born in the Palace of Herstal uh, in modern-day Belgium, uh, at the time part of the Kingdom of Francia, uh, or the Kingdom of the Franks, as it might be better known to some people. He was the illegitimate son of Pepin of Herstal. Now, the term illegitimate meant something a little different yeah. than uh, than it does today. It didn't carry as much weight. Yeah, it's not it's not so much that he was like fully disinherited or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like he was still well respected as a member of the family through you know most of his early life. However. His father, Pepin, Duke of the Franks, the first to hold the title of Duke of the Franks, um, his wife, his second wife, Plectrude, convinced him to disinherit all of the children he had with his mistress, Alpeda, and, well, that included Charles. Yeah. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, he was not in line at the start of his uh, illustrious career to inherit uh, many titles, um, including that titular one of the Duke of the Franks, which again was founded by his father Pepin. Um, but more importantly, he held a different title, and that was title of Mayor of the Palace of Austrasia at the time of his death in 714. He also held the titles of a Mayor of the Palace of a couple of other um, palaces at the time. Uh, at one point, uh, Neustria, at one point, Burgundy. He eventually gave those off to other uh, children uh, throughout his uh, rule. But by the time he died, he was still mayor of the Palace of Austrasia. Uh, and again, defining what that title means can be a little bit difficult yeah. because of the way historical texts are taken. It's kind of like uh, a de facto king, right? Like if you're the mayor of a certain area, you're basically just the resident of the palace. It, 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 I feel like it has a close comparison to uh, something that, uh, you know, our fellow Canadian listeners will, will kind of uh, sound a little bit familiar to them. It kind of is familiar to a constitutional monarchy in that the yeah. mayor of the palace was more or less the prime minister, whereas the king was a bit more of a ceremonial uh, position at the time. It kind of stemmed from um, the Pepinids, which named after Pepin, of course, um, who were the dynasty originally that Charles Martel was a part of. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of started to take control of the treasury, started dispensing patronage, doled out land privileges on behalf of the king. Again, should sound very familiar to uh, people accustomed yeah. to constitutional monarchies like us here in Canada. The Pippinids were the first in this region to really start taking that control, right, for themselves. Yeah, at the time, the ruling dynasty uh, for the Franks was the Merovingian dynasty. Now, prior to Charlemagne, the Franks, calling them united would be a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like Game of Thrones, really. Yeah, it was a lot of uh, situational-based kind of uh, working together when it suits you kind of a thing, yeah. right? So while they recognized a king... It was really more their individual head of state that held the real power in the realm, which, for the Pepinid dynasty, turned out to be the mayors of the palace. Uh, 
Again, uh, the most important title at that time of his death that he held was the title of the mayor of the Palace of Austrasia. At one point, he had held all three of the important palace titles within the uh, the kingdom of the Franks at the time, which were Austrasia, Neustria, and Burgundy. Uh, in 695, he left Neustria and Burgundy mayorships to his sons Grimwald and Drogo. Uh, badass names, by the yeah, way. Yeah, Drogo's a pretty <laughs> awesome name. I mean... <laughs> you can't deny that. There's some pretty good names in uh, uh, Martel's story, and I'm pretty excited to get to some of them. <laughs> if there's one thing this dynasty was good at, it was coming up with names. <laughs> yeah, what a legacy. <laughs> and then uh, Burgundy eventually fell into the hands of Charles's brother, Childebrand, who eventually became Duke of Burgundy. He was a key ally in the, his, his brother's battles of the Muslim forces later on in southern Francia. Yeah. But we're not going to get too much into him because it's a whole other, uh, a whole other story. Well, because this story is about Charles Martel himself, and the beginning of his story is actually pretty well. We're at that point now. Pretty much, yeah. So Grimwald died, unfortunately, the same year as his father, leaving both Austrasia and Neustria to his son Theodwald, who was eight at the time. As you can imagine, uh, the Austrasians. Didn't really like the idea of being uh, controlled by an eight-year-old. Nope. Uh, and over the years before uh, the death of Pepin, Charles Martel had begun gaining significant favor amongst the Austrasian people, much more than his nephews or his brothers had been gaining. Now, if you'll remember, the formerly mentioned Plectrude, <laughs> who was the initial uh, person that you know didn't want Charles Martel to inherit in the first place, she saw this. She saw the influence that Charles Martel had, and so upon the death of Pepin, and unfortunately his son as well, um, I don't know why I keep saying unfortunately when this was like centuries ago. <laughs> rest in uh, peace, rest in peace. We miss you already. <laughs> God, too soon. <laughs> um, but he, she sensed this threat that, you know, the people had more respect and more appreciation yeah. for Charles Martel than they did for her grandson. And seeing that, she had Charles Martel imprisoned in what she intended to make the capital of her kingdom at the time, which was Cologne. Yes. Obviously a name we recognize today. Still a significant city in Germany to this day. Yes, yeah, significant part of uh, Martel's story, too. Indeed. Um, not long after Pepin's death, uh, Chilperic II was proclaimed king of Neustria, which kind of all but confirmed their independence yeah. from the Franks and from Austrasia itself. Um they also took the Duchy of Burgundy with them, so a significant portion of territory gone from the Frankish kingdoms due to that. Um, and eventually, Chilperic decided he wanted to take Cologne, which, of course, crown jewel at the time. It was where all the money was held yeah. for the Franks. It was, it was what they wanted. It's a good place to attack if you're uh, looking for a little extra money. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so Chilperic eventually led an army to Cologne intent on seizing Austrasia, but in the resulting confusion, Charles escaped. And it's kind of where his story begins, for yeah. the most part. Yeah, like all great stories, right? The guy starts in prison. Like, I think, think of how many movies were inspired by a similar story to this, right? Where there's a revolutionary trapped behind prison walls, and they escape right at the perfect time to just kind of seize power. As someone who plays a significant amount of D&D and tabletop RPGs, I can attest to the fact that very, very many stories start with a prison break. <laughs> All the good ones, at least. <laughs> exactly. Um, however, even though he had gained that influence beforehand, and he still kind of maintained much of that that influence, it should be of note he wasn't in prison for particularly long. Yeah. Um, it was. It, this all happened relatively quickly and all in the same year. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, he didn't have a lot of time to lose that influence that he had gained. So he still held that respect. He was already acknowledged as a tremendous military mind. Um, and so he, he kind of still held a little bit more favor amongst the Austrasian people. Um, so when he did escape, he was able to muster some forces to his side. Yeah. However... He wasn't able to gain much of an army before the Neustrian forces descended on Cologne and were able to prevent Charles from really making it to the city for the most part as it was still kind of defended yeah. um, by the, the, the sort of troops of his stepmother. Yeah, and he was able to get some help, thankfully, uh, from, I believe it's the Phrygians. Am I pronouncing that right? The Frisians, yes. Um, modern-day modern Netherlands. 
Yeah, and they were able to provide a little bit of support for him, but it ultimately wasn't enough of the support that he needed to overturn the battle. And fortunately for him, uh, the uh, current person in charge, uh, what was her name? Plectrude. Uh, Yes, Plectrude, that's right. And fortunately, uh, Plectrude, I was able to buy off some of the invading forces, right? Because the whole point of them invading Cologne was for those riches. And uh, when Plectrude sent uh, the the troops what they basically came looking for, uh, it kind of signified the end of the battle. But also, it was an important time because it was the first and only loss that uh, Charles Martel ever faced. Yeah, exactly. And the thing, too, is that we call it his only loss, and history kind of remembers it as his only loss. Yeah. But the thing is, is that as you look into it, a lot of people kind of stretch the Battle of Cologne and the Battle of Ambleve into sort of the same battle in a lot of ways. Because what a lot of people believe, and again, you know, we're talking about centuries ago, so things kind of get mixed up in yeah. context and nothing is for sure. But a lot of people believe, and it fits in with his military strategies at the time, that he fainted a retreat in that yeah. battle in which he descended to the hills uh, in an attempt to train an army up, uh, recruit people to his side, muster up some more money and resources that he needed to go and defeat the Neustrians. A lot of people believe that he kind of recognized there was no way that he was going to win yeah. at Cologne, which, again, I think fits in very well with the strategies that he employed throughout his life. Um, so to me, it seems logical that it might be the case Basically, he descended into the mount, into the hills. I almost said mountains. Not really many mountains yeah, in, just uh, very, in, <laughs> near Cologne. Very hilly. So he descended into the hills, uh, gathered his forces. Uh, he split them sort of into numerous groups and began descending on his, uh, his enemies for sudden and shocking attacks along their sort of road back after receiving this bribe, if you want to say, from Plectrude, or this payoff. Um, They weren't really expecting to be attacked on the roads going back, so they were surprised by these attacks, forcing an almost complete military retreat from the area, which kind of cemented his legacy as a military genius and exponentially improved his reputation and following. Yeah, and what's really cool about this is, first off, I love that he had his first defeat and then decided to go do an 80s training montage in the hills, and then he basically trained his troops up for the battle. Yeah, literally, that's what I was imagining. It was that scene in Rocky where he just goes, he's running running up the stairs, he's chasing the bike, all that good stuff, right? And I like this because uh, it kind of signified, like, or showed, rather, his strategic mastery because in these attacks, they were often surprise attacks. And what was really cool is that he'd order his troops to surround an encampment and he would, like, kind of surround them and rush in. And this combination of surprise and being surrounded made a lot of the stationed armies and troops think that they had been attacked by, like, a massive army. And that caused a lot of the troops to retreat and run further away, which further broke up the ranks and gave uh, Charles the upper hand that he needed to kind of clear these people out and then, of course, collect the spoils of war. So I'm pretty sure he managed to collect a lot of the treasure that was uh, paid off to the fleeing armies. Yeah, uh, that was a big deal for, uh, you know, later on when we talk about like the, the, the Moorish battles and such, because they had a very, very much an economy that was based on raiding. Uh, mm-hmm. So to be able to get in and take those spoils away from them, that was huge for not only winning the battles, but for suppressing future conflicts and yeah. suppressing their ability to gain and maintain resources. Um, another thing that's really impressive about what Charles Martel sort of did with his military strategy is that. He created an actual standing army that was well trained. Mm-hmm. It was disciplined. It listened to him and only him. Now, that was something that was kind of going on in sort of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire at the time. But throughout most of Western Europe, that wasn't the case. Most of Western Europe at the time was working off of what was called a mayoral system. It was sort of the uh, precursor to the feudal system. Yeah. Um, in which you would have. I don't want to say vassals because that was more part of the feudal system, but essentially you would have lower nobility that would swear allegiance to you and they would provide you with a few things, but two major things, and those were taxes and levies. And those levies took the form of generally fiefs, peasants, um, you know, lower class people that they would essentially send to you to use as troops. Yeah, they were kind of the people in like medieval movies who they're like, give every man and child a sword. And that's really well what they were. They were really just a civilian army. 
Yeah, not well trained by any means, not, you know, well funded by a lot of means, right? Um, sure, they were given swords, they were given armor, didn't mm-hmm. really know how to use them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, that was a huge deal for him that uh, I think a lot of times gets a little bit more glossed over than it should be because if you have 5,000 well trained soldiers going up against 25,000 peasants, I'm putting my money on the soldiers. Yeah, and this makes a big difference. Like it, it was the difference maker in a lot of wars, even modern wars, and like World War One, World War Two, where the difference maker is uh, a seasoned veteran versus a bunch of brand new troops. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's basically it's it's the old adage of where uh, I'm going to go a, a little bit off on a, a sports thing here for a second. It's the old adage where whenever let's say Alabama is doing really well in college football, there's always those some people that'll be like, "Oh, they could beat the worst team in the NFL." No, they can't. No, they <laughs> there, can't. It's just a huge difference in experience. Yeah, it, it's it's never going to happen. Like, no college team is ever beating a professional team, right? And it's kind of the same deal in, in this aspect, right? You can throw on as many people into those levees as you want, but at the end of the day, you're just marching them into their death. <laughs> yeah, and this played a pretty big part in some of the future battles that uh, led up to some of his future successes, like with the Battle of uh, Vinci, or Vinci, I believe it's pronounced, and then mm-hmm. uh, the Battle of Soissons, and uh, that secured... Charles Martel is the um, the man to be respected, and it helped him boost himself into power and build powerful allies, like for a brief time. Uh, I believe Odo the Great, who uh, plays a pretty important role in one of Charles Martel's most well-known battles. Yeah, for sure. And uh, a thing, too, is that sort of the, the, the process of building these armies, too, almost, uh, almost led to an early downfall for Charles Martel in a way as yeah. well. Um, at the time, you were kind of just getting into... Almost, uh, you're coming up close to the Frank, the Reformation of the Frankish Church, bringing it into Catholicism as a whole. And the reason that this almost led to his downfall is when you're training these troops and you're supplying this armor and these weapons and spending all this time on them and paying them a, a salary, right? Because that's the only way you get a troop like that to agree with you, right? Because they weren't only using levies in the other parts of Western Europe. They were also hiring mercenaries, right? Yeah. The thing with mercenaries is they're only as good as the gold you have, right? Now, when you're paying a standing army yourself, you can expect a little bit more loyalty than you can from mercenaries, right? Yeah. So uh, there were other trained troops in the area as well, but Charles Martel needed a way to fund these troops and to pay them what they were worth. And yes, his his conquests into sort of other uh, areas around the outskirts of the neighbors of, of France and that did provide him with some plunder and some loot to do that. But where the bulk of that came from was his decision to seize and sell lands and property that were owned by the Catholic Church at the time in order to fund that army, which Hmm. nearly led to his excommunication from the Catholic Church, which is very ironic considering he went down in history being known as a savior of Christianity in Western Europe. That's funny. His uh, Charles Martel's story is kind of filled with that, right? He's imprisoned after uh, there's another heir contesting him rising to power. He escapes, rises in through the ranks, right? Gets all that reputation, the respect. And then he suddenly starts making an enemy out of the Catholic Church, only for him ultimately to be uh, called the savior of Europe, right? I think it is a really fascinating, it's a true underdog story throughout history. It, it really is. He he came from a lot of uh, a lot of roadblocks to get to where he was, and uh, all of it throughout it too. The impressive thing about it, when you go over his history, is that it really is driven by him. You know, it's not like he yeah. got lucky. It's not like you know it was the contributions of other people that led to his dominance. He was this figure that was just larger than everyone else at the time. Yeah, and it really gave him, uh, it solidified himself as like a person of note in history, right? I mean, there's a lot of people and rulers who were in the right place at the right time for an advancement or some kind of victory. But this is a guy whose successes were kind of forged on his own. He forged his respect in battle. He forged, you know, the nation that surrounded him just through relationships and Uh, putting people of power that he wanted in power there so that they would more easily work with him in the future. And just the amount of, just the sheer amount of civil wars this guy was winning and just basically locked him in as the de facto ruler of this area. Yeah, basically... In uh, you know the the years after the Battle of Cologne and Amblève, you know from we're talking 
basically the end or the beginning of 716, end of 715 through to 718, he basically just fought three solid years of civil wars just to try to reclaim the land that his father had already owned. Uh, you know, he fought wars against uh, against his brothers. He fought wars against his nephews uh, and eventually was able to claim the title that his father had claimed before him and had been vacant uh, since which was Duke and Prince of the Franks, though he never did take the title of king. He did declare Clothar IV as the new puppet king of Austrasia at the time, which kind of ushered in the era of Charles Martel kind of deciding who the king was going to be. Yeah, I think it's a, a pretty fascinating prospect, too. And I mean, he definitely earned a lot of the respect that he had, too, right? I mean, he got the nickname The Hammer after one of his most impressive battles, and I think we're going to dive into that just now. But there was that period from 718 to 732 where, you know, we said that he was dealing with those civil wars, but it's not like when he wrapped up with the civil wars, he just stopped. I mean, there were attacks coming from all over the place, including from the Saxons, who were giving him uh, quite a run for his money, just really getting annoying, getting in the way, and stopping him from dealing with some of the political affairs that he wanted to get done. And I love love his response to this. I mean, it's just kind of savage, but uh, the Saxons just kept trying to invade Austria and uh, Charles decided that they just needed to be punished and just decided to lay waste to all of their bordering strongholds, basically stopping all the conflicts just in time for uh, Charles Martel's most well-known battle. Exactly. And it was, uh, the, the thing is too, uh, um, where they're like Saxony and it was historical location, very close to Cologne and Sort of the area that was the the, the main or capital region of uh, of the Franks at the time, Austrasia, of course, but more to the extent that that Cologne itself was right near kind of the the northeastern border with Saxony at the time. So it, it was very petulant that the the Saxons kept you know uh, pushing him. It was it was very agitating to him. Yeah, and I love it. He's just finally got so fed up with them that he's like, all right, we're going to go along the rivers. We're going to destroy everything that we see, and they will no longer be our problem anymore. And it worked out because it took them a long time to recover. And by the time that the Saxons were really able to do anything, he had already, Martel had already kind of asserted himself as the dominant power. Like at that point, between his well-trained troops, the veterans, and his like tactical mastery. And I don't think we mentioned that he's kind of the father of uh, modern Cal Cavalry in terms of he basically pushed cavalry uh, to its limit before like having to invent stirrups basically so the only distinction between his troops and a lot of modern knights when we're talking about European history is just horse technology I mean ways to ride them more effectively uh, better ways to handle your equipment and he pushed that technology as far as he possibly could before you know he pushed himself into the final battle and what I think is super fascinating is that the battle that he's most known for he actually decided not to use any cavalry and I think that's fascinating and it's a, it kind of shows his uh, strategy and his intelligence when it comes to cavalry. Yeah, it also kind of shows his his uh, his willingness to adapt over time. Um, the Franks mm -hmm. at, at the time were much more known for fighting with their infantry than anything else. Yeah. Whereas it was more the the Moors and the the Muslim forces in Andalusia, modern day uh, Iberia, Spain, Portugal, that area, that uh, that used more cavalry with their troops as sort of their main. Uh, force, whereas the Franks kind of depended more at the time on the ability of their warriors and their infantry to stand true. But Charles Martel kind of ushered in a bit of a change in the way that cavalry was used in Western Europe. Yeah, and just in terms of uh, what's fascinating, too, is just how his knowledge of cavalry was basically what allowed him to turn the tables on a lot of these bigger armies. Because, you know, we talked a lot about some of the skirmishes that he faced, but most of the time he was fairly outnumbered. And one of the reasons that he relied so heavily on surprise is because of that uh, lack of numbers and support that he had against some of these uh, bigger enemies at the beginnings of his campaigns. Now, he overcame that by, you know, building respect and getting more people on his side where he was able to have quite a formidable army but just having that standing army mixed with his intelligence and his strategy uh and putting that all together uh, made him kind of an undefeatable general at that time because that's really what it was he was like a general king who was leading his forces from the front line and what i love about this time in history is that a lot of these leaders were actually fighting in these wars alongside their men yeah he, he was a true warrior king 
Yeah, and again, the the nickname the hammer. I mean, Martel just means the hammer. Am I right in that? <laughs> yes, it, indeed. I, I believe. Uh, <laughs> please, please don't. I know I'm Canadian, but French is one of my one of my least uh, adapted languages. But I believe it it, it is French for hammer. Uh, I might be wrong on that. Please don't quote me. I've also heard people say that it uh, is also its origin comes from like the god of Mars, and that Martel. Uh, means little Mars. So it could be that he was the hammer or he was the little god of war. But either way, it's a pretty good title to have. Indeed. <laughs> I, I would agree. That's a, it, If you're not going to be known as a king, I feel like hammer is, is probably a, a pretty good alternative. I think between uh, being called the hammer and uh, the, the mini god of Mars or the mini god of war, it's almost like Charles Martel was like literally Thor of his time. And when you look at some of these pictures of him, he's always got these feather ornamented helmets. He's got a giant battle axe or a mace. This guy literally is like a Norse god. You look, even the hair it kind of suits. Like he could probably be played by Chris Hemsworth in a movie. I mean, you know what? If they ever did a retelling, they have to bring uh, Hemsworth into the fold, I think would be pretty good. And I think we've waffled around it a little bit, but I think, you know, it's time to get into the Battle of Tours because this is a really impactful moment in the life of Charles Martel. And it also kind of is where he got his name and the nickname, The Hammer, because it's because of this conflict that he was recognized as basically one of the most epic and most badass generals of his time. Exactly. It, it, the Battle Tour, uh, sometimes referred to as Portier, depending on where you got your education from, um, or sometimes referred to as the Battle of Portier. I don't mean to say Portier and Tour are the same place. They're very different places. Um, yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, like, it, it, it sort of set the stage for what Charles Martel's legacy really became and what, what everyone references when they talk about him in a historical sense. Yeah, and we haven't talked about it too much, uh, but a lot of this has to do with the conflicts with the Moorish armies coming up through Spain, Portugal, all those areas, because they did get themselves uh, a pretty strong foothold in the, the kind of southern portions of France, and this allowed them to start sending skirmishes. And like I said, the Charles defeated the Saxons just kind of at the right time, because these raids had been ongoing for a while and had pushed pretty deep into their country, and it was important for them to kind of set the set the tone, you know, what was allowed and what wasn't. And and uh, for a while, uh, this was kind of being staved off by Odo in, uh, in Aquitaine, right? And uh, this was kind of his stronghold. And they weren't really allied with Charles, uh, but they did rely on one another. They kind of had this weird agreement and some treaties that had them living side by side. Um, but Charles broke some of those treaties and so did Odo, which kind of had them at odds while these skirmishes were happening. And uh, it didn't really work out for Odo the first time. I mean, the first time he did win, but he lost a great amount of people. And unfortunately, it's kind of thought that Odo's victory over the Moorish people um, kind of solidified his downfall in a way because he was bragging essentially that he killed se or 375,000 Moors and uh, this kind of triggered a much larger advance and it's kind of unknown what actually triggered uh, the Umayyad forces to move northward uh, but the leader uh, al Rahman al Ghafiki uh, guided his troops towards Tours where they faced off against Odo once again, except this time Odo called for help from Charles Martel, which kind of sets the stage for Martel's most well-known battle. Yeah, precisely. I mean, the Umayyads had spent sort of the a couple centuries prior kind of expanding over from uh, from sort of Eastern Europe. Um, in, in the year sort of I believe it's 711 uh, when they actually crossed the Strait of Gibraltar into the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, they kind of had, for a long time, sort of more focused their their uh, their efforts or their their military expansion efforts in uh, in Anatolia at the time, uh, yeah. modern day Turkey, which was of course controlled by the Byzantine Empire at the time. Now the problem with that is when they were trying to get their influence into Europe because they were one of the uh, sort of initially powerful uh, Muslim dynasties that had existed at the time. Yeah. And Christianity was enforcing its dominance in Europe. Now, they wanted to get into Europe. They wanted to spread their influence into Europe. And there was two ways they could do that. They could go through Turkey or they could go through Spain. Yeah. Now, the issue with going through Turkey is that you would have to go through Constantinople, which just was not an option at the time. Not that they didn't try. 
but it didn't work out too well for them. So yeah, they came up through the Strait of Gibraltar, very quickly conquered the vast majority of, of the Iberian Peninsula, named it An, uh, Al-Andalus, <laughs> uh, later referred to many times as Andalusia, etc. They pushed out the, the forces that were in there at the time, the Visigoths, and sort of, aside from a little chunk just at the top of the Iberian Peninsula, pretty much controlled the whole thing. They then expanded and moved their kingdom up further to the north and, as you said, began that sort of advancement. A key note to what their sort of strategy was at the time and sort of what I think really forced them to go more north was their dependence on needing to continually raid. So much of their economy was based on raiding those other kingdoms and bringing those spoils back into the economy that they needed to continually expand and continually raid into modern day yeah. France. And we joked about a little bit before the start of this podcast how it, it would be kind of weird to live in a raid based society now. Like it's a weird kind of concept where it's like you need to be constantly plundering in order to keep your economy going. And I think that this is kind of a fascinating thing because a lot of historians who look back at this time kind of do see these troops as not being able to push too much further north just because they had reached uh, kind of an equilibrium with how much stuff was coming in versus how many people that they were supporting. So it really was uh, something really did need to trigger them to move northwards, which is why I think Odo gets the blame for a lot of this stuff. Because when you start bragging about killing 375,000 Moors, um, you kind of start being taken seriously as an enemy. So it might have been like they were like, hey, our raiding economy is falling down. And they were like, all right, we need somewhere else to raid. So after that defeat, it kind of gave them that reasoning to be like, hey, let's start making our way north and see if we can start pushing into Austria and all these other places and starting with France. And uh, it's lucky that Odo was there the first time. But by the second time they came back, they kind of schooled Odo because they had been prepared. They've been training a little bit more. They knew how to deal with uh, these kind of proto-European troops. And it made it a lot harder for them the second time, which is why Odo actually had to kind of ask for help. And at this time, him and Charles weren't really at a good time, like in a good place. Uh, they had been bickering, breaking lots of treaties. But uh, Odo kind of uh, swallowed his pride and reached out to Charles Martel, who uh, was famous, as we said, for his surprise attacks. He kind of put his army in between Umayyad and uh, Tour, and this allowed them to basically have a chance and it was a complete surprise because the invading forces were not prepared to deal with massive amounts of infantry which is uh something they didn't think that they have, would have to deal with after their victory or after their last uh clash with odo right and uh, their forces were kind of split at the time too because i feel like and this is just this is just me in, in interjecting into it here it's not historical context on it at all but I feel like part of it was a little bit of overconfidence in that they yeah. knew, you know, that they had defeated Odo. They they thought that that was, you know, the biggest, you know, battle they needed to fight, right? So at the time, their leader, uh, Abd ar-Rahim al-Ghafiqi, decided to split his sort of forces into multiple raiding parties. So he'd sent yeah. them over to Burgundy. He sent them over to the western parts of Aquitaine. Um, sort of even stretching up further up the up the coastline, and he took his main force to try to go up and take Tour because Tour at the time was a very important trading hub. Yeah, it was also a religious center of the space as well, which meant that there was going to be a ton of gold and other like resources. Yeah, and and Martel being you know the the military expert that we have already painted him out to be saw the threat in this. So despite the sort of bickering that had gone on previously between him and Duke Odo, he realized that this was a threat to his kingdom. And so he got involved, and he did so in a spectacular way. As you said, positioning his troops between uh, between Tours and Pontier, uh, right at the confluence of the river, uh, sorry, of the river Klain and the Vienne rivers, which it was, it was just an expert positioning decision because as he put himself at this confluence of these two rivers on top of a hill in the middle of a wooded forest, it gave him so many advantages, especially knowing 
that he was going up against a troop of mostly cavalry. Yeah, and that was the big thing, right? Is that this is what I was talking about where his expertise in cavalry really kind of took charge because he realized that the majority of uh, the forces that he was going up against were on cavalry and he knew from his own experience and his skill riding that uh, it was kind of a fool's game to take them out in the open plains, right? So he backed himself up into a corner basically against the river so no one could advance from behind. But then he had this huge cover of uh, trees, which basically prevented any cavalry from even breaking the forest line. And the fascinating part, too, is that a lot of battles at this time were based on momentum. And especially when it comes to cavalry, that momentum is huge. You just keep going from person to person to person, mowing people down. But when you have to stop and break to go up a hill, and meanwhile you have men at the top of that hill, horses, all those things don't really make that big of a difference on that that first advance because you're really just, they become cannon fodder at that point. Now, it is important to note that when they did eventually get to the top of that hill, uh, they did have uh, Martel kind of on the ropes for a little bit there, but it was actually thanks to Odo that they were able to break these lines. And what I think is fascinating, Jeff, and you mentioned this, is that Uwe made troops were kind of split amongst all the other provinces. And uh, when Al uh, Gafiki realized that all of his troops were kind of spread out and f noticed that Martel was kind of held up there, it took him a couple of days to get all of his troops organized so that he could actually attack Martel. And uh, this is kind of an important moment because it not only gave Martel an opportunity to strategize and reinforce his own men, but as uh, more troops started coming on the uh, on the Uime or on the Yume. I can't say it right now for some reason. <laughs> Umayyad. Um, thank you. And as the troops started kind of gathering on the Umad side, these troops uh, would just send out little sporadic attacks. Like here and there, there'd be like 10, 20, a bunch of people, and they'd be trying to go uh, Martel into joining the battle, into breaking his line. And this kind of shows the experience and the benefit of having troops that are like full-time soldiers. Because inexperienced soldiers might have taken those pokes and chased the enemy back to their enemy line and made themselves vulnerable. But Martel had such strong control over his troops that they listened to him and they held their ground and refused to make themselves open to be vulnerable, which really solidified Martel's uh, ability as a strategist, but also as a strong leader because when you're in a situation like that where you're getting bombarded for horses or by horses over the course of like seven days morale starts to drop pretty quickly and it's a pretty big testament to martel's uh, style of leadership that these people were able to hang on for that long it also shows a significant difference in the control level of the two of the two sides as well and it, it shows how beneficial uh, Martel's whole strategy of training up his own soldiers was. Because, as I mentioned before, many of the troops with the Umayyads were raiders or levies that were provided for them. These people weren't super organized troops or soldiers. So when things started to, you know, turn the other direction a little bit, they more or less scattered, right? Whereas Martel's troops listened to him, they held the line, and they held strong and together. So when Martel did decide to send Duke Odo's troops around, it kind of left the, the Umayyads in this very precarious position where many of them, because, I mean, I'll let you get into a little bit more on the specifics of it, but essentially he sent Duke Odo's troops around not to really flank the soldiers, but to get to the Umayyad camp. Yeah, And the key to that was that the Umayyad camp is where they had stored all of those plunders from those previous raids. Yeah, Now, the Umayyads and the Moors, their, their warriors, they knew this. They knew that that's where their, their gold was. They knew that that's where their fortune was. So once the attacks started on the camp, they, they almost went rogue in that they wanted to go back and try to get what they could of their plunder and defend what they had gotten over all of these efforts of these years of raiding beforehand. Yeah. But, you know, Charles Martel's troops, they held strong. Yeah, and I think uh, Charles realized the vulnerability of uh, the... Uh, the Uwe Mad forces, uh, realizing that they were basically professional raiders and took advantage of that. So at, there was a certain point where there was a stalemate and uh, 
Martel actually started losing a little bit of ground. And it was at that point that he turned over to Odo, who was kind of watching the side flank there. And he's like, Odo, go around enemy lines. And when I was hearing this, I originally thought, oh, he's going to flank the enemy troops. This is going to be the advantage that they're looking for. But uh, he had a higher thought and a higher insight on this and sent Odo, like you said, to go destroy their encampment where all of their gold was. And versus Martel's troops who were holding strong and were professional soldiers. So when these Moorish troops had realized that Odo had basically skipped them over entirely and gone to where all their treasure was, they panicked. And what I love about this is nobody really noticed at first, but Odo just started burning all these tents and lighting them all on fire. So when people looked back and realized that their their essentially their base of operations was on fire, people panicked and rushed back to go save their treasure rather than uh, follow the battle. And what I think is really cool and shows the strength of Martel's army here is that uh, Charles's men, when they saw the people retreating, they didn't just chase after them. And this is a big mistake that a lot of generals make, especially new generals. They chase down people as they're trying to retreat, which opens them up for opportunities to be ambushed and taken down in kind of in a surprise attack. And because all those troops were spread out, Martel really had no idea to know for sure that everyone was there so he got his men to hold tight to stay and uh, what i think is really interesting about this is that uh, the way that uh, the moors actually retreated and this again goes down to the strength of not chasing in retreat because they decided to wait overnight before going to kind of plunder the camp that they had just burnt down and this was smart because when they woke up the next morning all the tents had been rebuilt and they looked like they were actively getting ready to like attack again but they realized that they had been abandoned and what uh, the Moorish people did was basically built a fake encampment so that they could sneak away in close quarters and get back to where they were basically safe. And I think this kind of shows that that definitive thinking with uh, Martel because he didn't open himself up to be attacked by those people and he still got all of the loot and the spoils of the battle. So it was a win-win for, Char uh, for Charles in this one. And again, this really solidified his position as the ruler of the Franks at this point because this was a really big turning point in history. I mean, we're talking about the for the first time, a lot of the Moors pushing into Northern Europe. And this made a huge difference when we're talking about the seed of history, where things might have happened. Now, there's a little bit of discussion when it comes to this. I mean, some people think that this was the turning point in history, and that if Charles had lost this battle, that all hope would have been lost for future Europe and France, and that the Industrial Revolution and all these things would have ha hung in the balance. But a lot of people aren't really sure it could have gone either way at this point, and it might not have impacted history. And I know, Jeff, you have some pretty strong opinions on how basically Martel, unless he died, it wouldn't have really changed the course of history. Yeah, now, a key thing, or a key point, too, in what really caused such a massive massive shift in the battle too is that in that conflict and as sort of after he had sent Duke Odo's cavalry around to the camp his troops killed Al Gafiki who died yes. on the battlefield I glassed over that I don't know how I missed that I <laughs> that's an important part of the battle <laughs> and as as he died of course his troops lacked that leadership right mm -hmm. which again led further into the whole scattering about the battlefield thing right now the reason i bring i bring that up here is because i feel like with the battle of tour it's it is a significant battle in history i don't know if it's as big of a turning point as a lot of historians think mm -hmm. it is now the reason for that is a lot of the reason the moorish troops pushed so hard when they did is because winter was coming soon the moorish troops knew that they were not going to be able to hold up against Martel's troops in the winter. Yeah. They knew that Martel was just better trained, better able to fight in those conditions. So they tried to push themselves when they could so that they could get it done before winter fell, right? Now, I think that is a very key point to remember because had they won that battle, the Moors, and Charles Martel, let's say, retreated, right? they wouldn't have been able to maintain that position for much longer. They would have had to retreat back into Iberia anyway to regroup, to recoup, to, you know, gather their, their plunder and just rebuild, essentially, right? Because they wouldn't be able to keep the fight up over winter. There's that... I don't think that it would have led into an immediate sort of spread into at least the northern parts of France yet. Now, I do think it might have led to some more expansion into Aquitaine. Uh, which, of course, yeah. would have been significant. It would have led into a sort of uh, a, a larger presence by, by, the, by sort of the Muslim faith in Europe at the time. 
which could have led to, to further expansion too, but I feel like the only way it would have been a turning point in the opposite direction to to the point where some historians are saying, you know, it would have led to the, the Quran being taught in the University of Oxford and stuff like that. And it's, you know, I don't think that that would have been that to that extreme unless Charles Martel had died. Yeah. And when he died matters, though, too, right? Because he had a very important uh, lineage that led to the future of the rest of that part of the world, right? Exactly. A key, a key point to, uh, to remember in all of this uh, is that this battle took place, as we've been, been talking about, or as we've noted before, in 732. Now, the key about remembering that date in terms of their dynasty is that Charlemagne, again, the, the, the big name out of this dynasty, was born in 747, which means he was not yet born when this battle took place. If Charles had died at that battle, there is a fairly strong chance that Charlemagne would have never risen to the power that he had. And that ultimately would have shaped the entire rest of history, right? Because not only a massively influential person, but Charlemagne became the first emperor to rule the West since the original fall of Rome. And that kind of influence uh, doesn't go without notice if it's suddenly taken away from history, right? Now, obviously, uh, Charles went on to do even more after defeating the the Umayyads at Tours. Uh, he did go on to fight more uh, Moorish conflicts and sort of try to push them back as well. But he also expanded, you know, his 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 goals outside of war. Um, after 732, I wouldn't say things got peaceful, um, <laughs> especially not by today's standards. It was early um, retirement for it was early retirement for Charles Martel. He was still active. He couldn't quite let go and fully retire. Yeah, th- things calmed down a little bit, and he was able to sort of focus his efforts some some other important things like politics and like restoring his relationship with the Catholic Church, which yeah. obviously they were open to after the repelling of of the Muslims from. Um, from uh, the northern portions of Europe, at least. Um, It should be noted that the Umayyads still maintained control in Iberia for a long time after after that battle. However, they were not able to expand uh, past the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, modern-day Andorra, into France, which is a, you know, it it is a key point, right? Um, And it was super beneficial to the Catholic Church, obviously, to maintain those regions, right? Yeah, and for for that reason, it's possible that the importance of this battle was actually kind of blown out of proportion as almost like a propaganda tool in Europe, right? Like, either way, Charles Martel got the good end of the stick because his reputation skyrocketed along with his status and power. But it also was kind of of a unifying force to protect the rest of North Europe from the threat of invasion. Exactly. In this sort of time of of more, I don't want to say peace, but calm, let's say, he was able to sort of... uh, kickstart uh the frankish the reformation of the frankish church he established new dioceses across modern day germany he played a strong role like i said in that reformation he worked closely with and diligently to protect the future saint boniface who became known later as the patron saint of germania and the apostle to the germans so and i think it's a name that we all recognize despite maybe not knowing a whole lot about it or where it comes from we hear St. Boniface, and we're like, yeah, that's a name I know, right? Yeah. So it, he, it was key in offering his protection to St. Boniface, who actually said at one point that he would not have been able to do the things that he did if it wasn't for the protection that Charles Martel provided him. Yeah, because that's really what he did, was he stabilized that part of the world so that governments and monarchies could move forward with stability, right? Because it's one thing, I mean, in a raid-based economy, I mean, war isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. But if this goes on for too long, you neglect a lot of your relationships, you neglect uh, the politics, and, you know, it's just as easy to go down as a nation politically as it is to a war. So it was really important that the the security that Charles Martel, uh, like, kind of established in that part of the world, like, Austria benefited greatly from this kind of in-between uh, space. Like you said, it wasn't quite peace, but it wasn't all-out battles either, and it allowed... Uh, Charles Martel to really focus on what was important moving forward because he was starting to get up there and his death wasn't too far from this point. So it's not surprising to me that he turned his face towards uh, more political things rather than the battlefield. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, it was a real, it, again, we talk about 
the impact he had on military and on the Catholic Church and such. But oddly, the biggest impact he may have had is politically, uh, because he sort of ushered in um, the primary use of the system of feudalism, which, yeah. although is kind of tough to truly define, did more or less become the dominant political system in Europe for you know, until the 1700s, you know, it, it repelled far beyond, you know, his lifetime. Yeah. And that's something that even is common in Charlemagne's story, his grandson too, right? Because he was one of the first emperors to rule uh, almost religiously, right? I think he's referred to as one of the first sane kings or the sane rulers or emperors rather of this time. So this is something, an idea that was kind of passed on uh, through generations. And it's something that uh, wasn't unique just to Charles Martel as an individual and his family. Family. It looks like he pushed a lot of positive ideas forward to uh, the next generation. Yeah. So like, as, as a system, feudalism is kind of tough to define, but loosely, it's a system of centralized, although I use that word very, very loosely, yeah. um, a centralized government featuring lieges, vassals, and fiefs. Basically, oversimplified three levels of, uh, of three classes, essentially, right? Now, the lieges were obviously at the top, right? Because you could have lieges that were dukes that were just lieges because counts swore allegiance to them, right? Yeah. So it, they they were the higher rank of you know their their own vassals, right? Now lieges would have their own vassals. Those vassals, as I stated earlier, would provide taxes and and levies to and resources to uh, their liege, who sort of ruled the the overall kingdom, right? So think of it as. A count would be a liege or would be a vassal to a duke. A duke would be a vassal to a king. A king would be a vassal to an emperor, right? Yeah. As you sort of go forward in this system, you not only take in your own vassals, but you kind of take in their vassals too, right? Yeah. Which is why I use the word centralized loosely <laughs> is because it, it sort of um, – it came to a point where when feudalism was used uh, throughout the Middle Ages in terms of the Holy Roman Empire, it became very uh, – a very common phrase to say that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman yeah. nor an empire. It was a multi-leveled marketing uh, campaign. <laughs> it was essentially like the European Union is today, where yeah. it, it sort of, it, it, yeah, it was kind. It kind of had some power, but but not you know a ton, right? Like so, it, it's it's a system that you know it worked sort of for the time, but it only really worked enough. Right. Like, it, yeah, it, it wasn't something that was going to, uh, you know, branch further beyond that. It was just what they needed at the time. It was more than what came before it. And it did kind of lead into the evolution and development into the political systems that we kind of do use today. The, the fiefs would work, of course, underneath the vassals. They would be the ones that would be supplied as levies. They would be the ones supplying taxation to those vassals. And it's sort of just this system of adding in middlemen. <laughs> yeah. Until until you get to the top. Um, now, a key point to this as well is remembering that at the time, it was Frankish tradition to use Confederate partition uh, as your inheritance when you died, which means a, a liege would leave not all of his land to his eldest son, as a lot of us are, are used to today through the primogeniture system, but instead they would leave portions of their lands to their kids. So if you had four sons... Your empire was ascent, or your kingdom was essentially split up into four portions and given to those sons, yeah. right? Which led to a lot of instability at the time because once you split up those kingdoms, the borders become very unstable, uh, leading to constant civil wars, shifting borders, which kind of caused the whole, you know, uh, the, the mishaps of the Middle Ages. Yeah, and it kind of re, if you really examine how uh, Martel got his start, I mean, when Pepin died, it was the exact same situation. You know, you had people uh, vying for power, and the same thing happened when it came to Martel's death in 741. I mean, the same, he had one son, Griffo, who I love his name, by the way, <laughs> who didn't even get, like, mentioned in the will until, like, a week before the guy died, which caused the other brothers, who had the land already kind of pre-distributed, to kind of turn against the guy. So even though he kind of created this era of stability, you kind of notice the inherent flaw with this system is that as soon as a ruler dies and it's split up amongst the sun, all these allegiances and loyalties are suddenly up in the air once again, and you're back to an era of instability until one or more of these leaders or brothers can come together. Yeah, exactly. And I think a key point, too, to show 
just how far that I, I love that shows just how far Charlemagne kind of came in terms of from going from almost being excommunicated to being touted as this savior of Christianity. As in, in 739, Pope Gregory III kind of begged for Charles's support in a conflict with uh, Lutbrand, who at the time was the king of the Lombards. Uh, mm-hmm. But Charles turned down the Pope's pleas because he had been a former <laughs> ally to Lutbrand. So yeah. he didn't want to go to war against him. So and, and despite this, he was still able to grow his influence on Christianity and Catholicism after that, right? Even in the final years of his life, right? So it kind of almost dictates a moment where, a brief moment in history for for this tiny little spot in time where the liege almost had more power than the Pope, which is, is crazy to think of when you look at how most of the Middle Ages yeah. rolled out. For that time, it's unheard of to for anybody to be rivaling the Pope in terms of raw power over the realms, right? Because the, the Pope had the money, the like the papacy had the control and it was pretty easy to uh, make an enemy out of somebody who suddenly opposed the church because they were no longer uh, fighting for the holy empire right exactly charles himself charles martel died quietly in 741 after his health began deteriorating in the years prior in sticking of course with then frankish tradition he split his lands up upon his death to his children carloman pepin the short and as you said eventually Griffo. Like I said to you before this all started, Griffo sounds like the background character in a Simpsons episode. Or like a, a, a new Street Fighter character. Yeah. <laughs> he has the name of the third child. They're like, what can we name this guy? <laughs> I don't know, Griffo. <laughs> I, I actually, I really like that reference. It's like the first child, you're like, oh, I'm going to name it after my dad. The second child, you're yeah. like, oh, I'm going to name it what I want to name it or like a middle name of a relative or something. The third child, by the time you have the third child, you're like, ah, whatever. Griffo. <laughs> Screw it. Griffo. So I think we got a pretty good summary of Charles Martel and his, some of it, his exploits, his influence, and uh, as well as the impact that he had on kind of modern Europe. So he really was a pretty well-rounded guy. He invented some pretty awesome military tactics. He mastered cavalry for what it was, considering the technology limitations at the time. He had a son named Griffo, which is just fantastic. And his most notable heir was Charlemagne, who ultimately became the first emperor to rule the West since the fall of Rome. So not only is Martel uh, a military genius, uh, but he also left a very clear mark on history. And it's always a good sign when you're talking about somebody hundreds of years later, or thousands of years later, rather. And it definitely tells you that he was at least a well-appreciated man if he died peacefully because so oftentimes you hear these stories about rulers who shaped history and they get killed by some bizarre means or die from some bizarre illness and it's nice to know yeah it's nice to know that Charles Martel uh, even though he started in a pretty rough place was actually able to die a relatively peaceful man and uh, I think that kind of is the the hero's journey and I think that's what makes Martel such a fascinating uh, figure in history because he lived literally started from the bottom and became the essentially I, the ruler of all of Austria. I think uh, uh, something that really highlights uh, your, your point on that is that when uh, when the last king of, of Charles's sort of reign passed away in 737, he didn't even bother to declare to appoint a new king, right? Because because at the time, the last two kings before that, Martel had essentially appointed them and just chosen them, and then had them imprisoned yeah. and and just held by himself, right? Essentially imprisoned. I mean, it was like a version of house arrest, but still. But when when that last king died in seven thirty seven, it was just and he didn't appoint a king. Everyone just kind of accepted it. Everyone was like, yeah, yeah. okay, well, no king, that's fine, whatever, right? Which is is ridiculous. And then of course with Charles gone in seven forty one. A new king of the Franks was appointed for the first time in four years. Like as soon as he was dead, right? His his kids were like, "Yeah, yeah, Child Eric the Third, you're 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 the new king now," and he did hold hold the title of king until his death in 751, as the last of the Merovingian kings, which ushered in a new dynasty in Central Europe, the Carolingian dynasty. Uh, Charles's son Pepin the Short then took the mantle of king of the Franks, paving the way for his son, also named Charles, of course better known as Charlemagne, <laughs> who would eventually become the first king of the Roman Empire, uh, or of the Western Empire, as you said, since the fall of the Roman Empire. 
which was nearly four centuries before that. Yeah, this was a, a really fantastic read and a really great insight into this time in history. And I appreciate uh, you bringing this topic to my attention, Jeff. Uh, I'm hoping that we can cover a lot of uh, other really cool historical topics, some concepts in history, maybe some people. And I appreciate you pitching this idea to me. Uh, we're going to try making these videos or these podcasts rather on a fairly bi-weekly, but I'm not sure what we're going to do yet, monthly, weekly, whatever. But uh, I think I had a lot of fun talking about this subject. And I hope uh, whoever is listening enjoyed the subject as well. And I think we did it justice for our first time. We'll see how the quality turns out at the end of it. But if you enjoyed this podcast and you want to see more or listen to more, uh, make sure you leave a comment, like the video, and uh, subscribe. And let us know what kind of cool subjects you think uh, Jeff and I should cover. Uh, I'm kind of curious about learning about war horses after talking about uh, Martel's love of cavalry. But uh, I think we'll have to hash something out. If you guys have any great ideas, ideas let us know for sure and jeff thank you again for uh, bringing this to my attention and starting this project with me of course i look forward to uh to going through it with you as well and yeah hopefully we can get some some great ideas from everyone keeping in mind you know we're not trained historians so we're no. doing our best here trying to keep it entertaining for you and everything as much as we can as well so uh go easy on us uh with the pronunciations <laughs> yeah and i think this would definitely serve as kind of a if you're somebody who's not overly familiar with these beads in history uh maybe this could be your entryway into a diving deeper into Charles Martel and maybe the history of Charlemagne and all those other great names like Griffo that we mentioned. So it might be a sidestep for someone. This might not be for the history buff, but might uh, lead as a kind of a step off point for somebody who's curious about this. So if you have any other things you'd like to learn a little bit more about, like I said, leave them in the comments. And thank you, Jeff. And uh, we'll see you next time we cover some cool historic topics.